Well, hello, everyone. To you in the room and those of you joining in online, whenever or wherever you are, a warm welcome to Smoky Hill Vineyard. If you didn't know, this is Alpha. It's an Alpha course, and you'll hear more and more about it during this time. If you have a Bible, please turn with me to Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. This is in the right half of your Bible, what's called the New Testament. This text is situated in one of the four biography accounts of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're in Luke chapter 6, verse 22. While you flip or scroll there, my name is Greg. I'm our student's pastor here. Speaking of students, students, you know this, but for those of you unawares, uh, my wife and I, Becca, we were in Chicago this past week celebrating our one-year anniversary. Yeah. We made it a year, folks. We're one year in. We have a dog. We have a baby on the way. So you could say it's getting pretty serious. I say that because we had a flight from here to Chicago on Sunday at 9.43 a.m. And we got delayed. Wait for it. 22 separate times. Could you tell that I was counting? I have a six-month-old pregnant wife, and I'm feeling exhausted and powerless. And finally, we get on our plane at about 5.30 p.m., and we start to back up, and we get halted. And there's thunderstorms, so we're grounded again. Then we push back once more. We stop again. The captain gets on the intercom and says, "Uh, sorry, folks, we're waiting for another plane to come get us and tow us in. Our engines won't start. It's like, are you serious right now? (laughs) Like, this is comical at this point. And I start to ask, God, do you want us to go to Chicago at this point? And even if the engines start working, will they keep running as we go on this plane ride? Do we even want to be on this plane? We got safely to Chicago, but why do I mention all of those things? Well, three things. One, I thought it was fascinating uh, to observe my internal responses to all the delays, as well as the morale of all the passengers at DIA. Two, another thought came into mind from the Holocaust survivor turned Jesus follower, Corey Temboom, when she says, When a train goes through a tunnel, And it gets dark. You don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and you trust the driver. And then three, while I'm mixing metaphors here, three, I thought of the church. I thought of the church because I'm not sure what your experience has been, but mine for the last 10 years of my life on how the church is functioning in this world feels a lot more like this plain experience, delay after delay. Are you waiting for the church to become all that she's intended to be in this world? And if God has appointed this vehicle, this vessel, the plane, to be the best mode of traversing this world, why so many hiccups? Similarly, if God has appointed this vehicle, this vessel, the church, to be the primary source of hope in this world, Why so many tangles? Now consider with me for a second three trends that we have seen in this nation. First, the distrust of organizations, including institutions. The church is at an all-time high. Second, young people among us raised in the church are leaving the church and not coming back at record rates. And third, the loneliness and social isolation is rampant. And it's interesting, this appears that an entire generation is looking outside the church, looking elsewhere for the very thing the church is called to provide. And this actually coincides with the Harvard researchers as they look into deciphering why many modern millennials are seeking out meaning, community, and ritual in the absence of religion. This longing in the every human heart is, I want to belong and matter. Belonging and mattering are this they're showing us. 
that this transcendent craving has not gone away. It has been replaced. Cue the quote from the article, CrossFit is my church. Or Soul Cycle is my cult. In, but in a good way. Huh. Many people are searching for self-actualization, fulfillment, and a spiritual connection. The role of the church is to show that people are seeking these things, but they are found in a deep relationship with God, the living God, and his people. If you want a good workout, go to the gym. If you want to find meaning in life, come to Jesus. And that's where we, as a church, are setting our gaze during this series. What if Jesus was serious about the church? Mike kicked off last week with, who is the church? To use his line, we need you to be who God's made you to be so we can become the church he has intended us to be. Tonight, I'm going to address a double entendre how is the church? How is the church? The first job of any leader is to define reality as it is. So how is the church? And in light of who the church is, how is the church meant to live in this world? Luke chapter 6 verse 12. We'll read, I'll pray, and then we'll dive in. Sound good? Sweet. Here we go. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. One of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When the morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And then just a little while later, Matthew 16, verse 18, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's pray together. God, each of us come to you as honestly as we know how. And we're asking for you to do what only you can. For you to meet us, speak to us, shape us in a way that's perceivable, both personal and powerful. So would you come by your grace for your glory. And if this is new or normal for you, I'd encourage you to take a few deep breaths. In and out. Well, Holy Spirit, we trust that you're going to produce what you want to produce in us. So we might partner with you in what you're doing in this world. And we pray that for the sake of Jesus' name. Amen. There's a public health crisis that no one wants to talk about. That's the title of the researcher's Tyler Vanderville. Doesn't that sound like a researcher's name? And Brandon Case. Just in case. They tell us that something about the communal religious experience seems to matter. Something powerful takes place there and here that enhances our health and our well-being. Get this, they say it is very different than those that pursue a solitary spirituality. The recent research has shown a reduced health risk for regular church attenders versus no attenders. Look with me. 29% have a reduced risk of depression. 33% chance reduced uh, of risk of death. 33% reduced risk of adolescence illegally using drugs. 50% reduced risk of divorce. And 84% reduced risk of suicide. So as of 2021, the church, in all its foibles and tangles, has done something for human flourishing. According to the stats, quite a lot. And with that in view, if you are here right now, 
or you are joining us online, you have done something for your whole body health. Way to go. And still, in recent years, pastors and preachers have come to ask this question, how can the church adapt to the ongoing landscape and challenges? And maybe the even more alarming question, will there be a church that matters? The recent pandemic, the political divisions, racial tensions, and a growing number of people deconstructing their faith are contributing and impacting the church's future. Sky Gentani, in his book, argues that a large part of these challenges has to do with what he calls modern captivity to consumer values. He says, rather than an event, a building or an institution, the New Testament calls the church to be a community living in communion with God for the sake of others in the world. Likewise, in chapter 5 of What If Jesus Was Serious?, then our goal should be more than just attending church. Look closely at Sky's words here. Just as it is possible to attend school and not be educated, parents and students, you feel this, it is entirely possible to go to church and not be living in communion with Christ, especially when the church is defined institutionally rather than communally. It follows that just as education is bigger than going to school, so our life with God is meant to be bigger than just attending church. Consequently, that is why we are directing our hearts and our hands to cultivating an environment like Alpha to, one, see our whole lives as an expression of God's mission to the people that Jesus came to serve and to save. And two, that we would see the life and function of this church not only look inwardly, but to look externally. These two ideas pull together Sky's two big thoughts on chapters 4 and 6. How is the church meant to function? And here's the first one. If Jesus was serious, then his church should mend social divisions, not reflect them. And two, secondarily, then following Jesus isn't about me, but about us. Remember the first text we read in Jesus calling his disciples to him? The church is called to courageously and prophetically, in this sense, overcome the divisions of the world. But all too often it reflects or even reinforces them. According to LifeWay Research, our world in our culture is increasingly becoming more diverse. And many pastors are actually talking about diversity. But it appears that most people are happy where they are and with whom they are. Do you get it? Mostly they contend that our world is driven by pragmatism. It's like what Dumbledore says in Harry Potter. Do you remember what he says? Soon we are going to have to choose between what is right and what is easy. Pragmatism is easy. Doing the hard work of diversity is right. And when we look at Jesus' first followers through whom God shook the world, we don't see a church that overlaid pragmatism over diversity. For example, even in the small sample size of the 12 disciples, we see a staggering and shocking amount of diversity. Follow me. As it was said, Simon was a zealot. He was a Jewish freedom fighter who was willing to use violence to overthrow Rome. And Matthew, a tax collector, a Jew who betrayed his own people so that he could earn a commission for himself. These were the tensions that Jesus welcomed into his circle. These are the ones he held with the people he would soon call friends. This was the new community he was after. This chapter surfaced uh, something in my mind. If you know what a meme is, this is what it surfaced for me this week. It was the miracle that we don't often talk about, that Jesus had 12 close friends in his 30s. And depending on where you are in life, that hits a little different, doesn't it? 
And still, Jesus called both of these men, Matthew and Simon, to not only apprentice under him, but he also asked them to embrace each other as brothers. What united Simon and Matthew is what unites us, is not a common political, cultural, or economic vision for life. It is Jesus. Jesus himself and nothing else. Amen? God calls us together not only for the practical, but for the beautiful. Yes, he calls us to the practical means of being together, but so much more, it's a symbolism of the beautiful. Isn't that what our world needs right now? Or as one of my Indian uh, pastor friends told me, quote, most of what happens in Christian churches, including miracles, can be duplicated in Hindu and Muslim congregations. But in my area, only Christians strive, however ineptly, to mix men and women of different castes and races and social groups. That is the real miracle. And that observation is so well captured in this picture from chapter 6. Look with me. If Jesus was serious, then following Jesus isn't about me. It's about us. In the New Testament, we have a word for you. Often in the New Testament, it is in the plural, we, us, or our. But in the English, it is just for the singular, I, me, or mine. This one assumes a faith is personal, where in the plural, it assumes faith is communal. I almost entitled this talk, You, Lost in Translation. Can you see how I got there with that? Sky's words are fitting here. Look closely. A significant amount of the Bible's teaching makes little sense or can be dangerously misapplied if divorced from the communal vision of faith. And this is why, with the lack of nuance in the English language, combined with our strong cultural value of individualism, can specifically and profoundly warp the way in which we read the Scripture. Americans, we say you when speaking to an individual or a group, except in the South where they say y'all and attempt to fill in the gaps. This reminds me of my friends who are from the South who say, you can put a bow tie on a turd, but it's still a turd. The point is, anyone can put on a nice piece of attire for a night. But it does not do well to cover up the stuff that's underneath it. And similarly, I take very little stock in my life these days when someone comes and tells me that they're a Christian. Does your life, does my life resound with what 1 John chapter 2 says? If anyone claims to live in God, they should live their life just as Jesus did. Who? Now, many of us will never learn Hebrew or Greek, of which the Old and New Testament were written in. And we can't change the English language to help us. But teenagers are trying to change the language, aren't they? Students, I have a question for you. When did literally start meaning figuratively? Lord, have mercy. Right? Students, you know I love you. Kidding aside, here's some biblical literacy for you. Whenever we engage the scripture, we must be attentive to our cultural biases and our blind spots. We approach the text from a vantage point. One scholar says that whenever we read the scripture, we're engaging in a cross-cultural experience. And we would do well to slow down every time we encounter the word you in the New Testament letters and ask ourselves not only how this is applied to me, but also what does this mean for us? Or as Gollum from the Lord of the Rings says, for us is. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, look with me. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
picking up the twin themes that we started with at the beginning, what circulates with every human heart is I want to belong and matter, belonging and mattering. There's another set of longings that attach to those two. It is I want to have a cause and a community to strive with. Some quick biblical theology for you. If you were to survey the Old and New Testament and extract out the three most common traits or motifs of the church, they would be this. God's bride, Jesus' body, and the Spirit's building. God's bride, Jesus' body, and the Holy Spirit's building. Did you see the threefold descriptor? The PhD, Greg Allison, in his book, The Church, an introduction, a short study in systematic theology, calls this, this. The inseparable operations of the Trinity mean that this recreation does not come into existence apart from the work of the Father and the Holy Spirit through the gospel. Indeed, the church is a Trinitarian recreation. The bride of God, the body of Christ, and the building of the Holy Spirit. That took a lot of reading just to get to that rich phrase. But isn't it staggering? You might say, but well, what sense does this have any bearing on my life at all? Well, one, if you are feeling disillusioned or discouraged with the church to set the record straight, this place is not about us thinking that we're good people, polishing our accomplishments. But for those who understand that the grime of life that we incurred by what we have done or what has been done to us, isn't the dominating reality of our story, nor does it determine our destiny. It is determined and predicated on the one who does not shame us. He, Jesus, came to wash us. He purchases us to give us a beauty that we could never give ourselves, and he makes us a garment of praise. He does not steal your identity. He wants to elevate it to the place and the who you were meant to be. That existential cry that you and I have for belonging, mattering, and meaning are found in the Son of God who initiated for you and I and sacrificed for us. Who comes to you and I with holy love like he did Peter in that moment. In one sense, he's saying to Peter, you are acknowledging me as the Christ. Peter, you're the rock. And not too long after that, uh, he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. What's going on with that? It's not you who are listening to me. It's not you, Peter, who are evil, but what's behind you that has twisted pursuits. Jesus says you have in mind the things of humans, but not the things of heaven. Eyes here. A crossless Christ is demonic. Do not go to a church that does not preach Christ crucified. Jesus would not have it with Peter, nor will he have it with us. Peter, like us, had a lot of growing up to do, did you know? He was confronted multiple times by Jesus then by Cornelius, and then again by Paul. He could not have done it without others. Can I share with you a verse that has been rewiring the circuitry of my heart for the last number of years? Do you want to see it? Romans 15, look with me. Accept one another, then as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God, For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles, us, might glorify God for his mercy. Did you catch it? Accept one another as Christ accepted you. Man, I do not do that well. Do you? What's the crux of it? This is why I cannot do faith alone. 
This is why you cannot do faith alone. Following Jesus is not a solo sport. I cannot become I am all, I am all meant to be in Christ without you. And you are not able to become all that you're meant to be in Christ without me. And we together cannot become all that we're meant to be in Christ without each other. Do you see it? And this is where Sky lands in chapter 7. If Jesus was serious, then the church is where we wrestle with God together. I don't know if you can tell, but I wrestled in middle school. I was pretty good, but it was only because I was one of the lightest in middle school. No one could match me. But man, did I need to learn the moves of how to wrestle. While some of us wrestle in sports, some of us wrestle in life. And what's more is many of us wrestle with questions associated with living this life. What will I wear today? Who are my friends right now? And how do I alleviate this nagging feeling of blank in my life? Each of us, to the degree that we are honest, have asked, what if everything in life is really just meaningless? This is the, one of the struggles of faith. Is there a God-directed arc to this universe, a purpose beyond what I can see right now? Or is this arc just an illusion? A cosmos ruled by an unsympathetic God with an unbending line perpetually leaning towards chaos. As we face these trials and triumphs of life, we will all contend with these questions in our innermost being, whether believer or unbeliever, Christian or atheist. Now, doubt does not disqualify you. Being a Christian means we have shifted the focus of our struggle. As Eugene Peterson says, believers argue with God. Skeptics argue with each other. Now, I think Peterson was half right. All of us have a mixture of both believer and skeptic in us. That is why we have a biblical companion of the person Jacob to locate us in the story. In the Old Testament, Jacob was a flawed man full of faith, doubts, and fears, and this directed his insecurities, which led him to seek to control by manipulating others. Does it sound like anyone you know? Don't point at them right now, okay? Jeez. Jacob, he lied. He cheated. He stole his brother's birthright. One night, Jacob encountered God in the form of a man. Jacob wrestled with the Lord all night, trying to force God to bless him and alleviate his fears. Eventually, Jacob surrenders his attempt to take God's blessing, and he trusts him instead. Before he wakes up, the Lord gives him a new name, Israel, meaning wrestles with God. Jacob's story personifies our life of faith. We trust him. And then we wrestle and we struggle because we're flawed and fearful. A church being assembly of believers is simply put a community that wrestles with God together. It's where we struggle openly with each other and not privately. Where questions are asked and sometimes answered. And when there is no answer to be found, the church is where we find comfort, support, resources, and encouragement. And friends, this is the vision of Alpha, to be a safe place where people can bring their doubts and their fears, their reticence and their resistance to the one who sees them, knows them, and loves them. The part we play is invitation, to join in a conversation. In this conversation, we allow other people to meet each other in a non-judgmental, hospitable environment we listen to a talk, and then we get to share our thoughts in a dialogue. It's a one-of-a-kind conversation. In Alpha, it's a series of group conversations that explore the basics of the Christian faith in a non-judgmental, informal, hospitable environment. Would you join us? 
after running Alpha for the years that I have had in schools, in skate parks, in coffee shops, in churches, I've found that this practice for the church to be the most effective way in reaching this current generation. My favorite guest is the one who shows up arms crossed, argumentative, and cold. And then you start to see the Spirit soften them, pursue them. And then they come to a profession of faith faith that rewires their entire personhood and their external life too. This is what loving, listening, and inviting does. I'm inspired by our national director, Jay Pathak, when he says this, we don't love our neighbors to convert them. We love our neighbors because we are converted. We say that once more, we don't love our neighbors just to convert them. We love our neighbors because we are converted. So, who are you and I inviting? Alpha starts this Wednesday at the porch, 6.30. Free food, community, faith, and of course, dessert. Returning and ending with our thematic question, how is the church? The recent stats say the church has actually gotten back to pre-COVID numbers. But... As we survey the wreckage, what we see a lot was the church was built on celebrity, not raw community. It was built on celebrity, not raw community. And this can make us cynical or humble. The first leads to detachment and more cynicism. The latter leads to humility. And humility flings wide heaven's doors as we experience his power and his presence. Remember the public health crisis data I shared? The research challenges us the growing number of Americans who self-identify as spiritual but not religious to consider this, that whether their spiritual journeys might be better undertaken in a like-minded community of seekers who under the discipleship of a tried and tested person has given us a faith of belief and practice. Research suggests that those who do neglect meeting together, Hebrews 10 from last week, likely miss out on the powerful reality of both impacting our health and so much more. The data is clear. Going to church remains central to true human flourishing. So pulling it all from the theoretical to the personal. If Jesus was serious about the church, which we have seen, he is. He inaugurated it. He initiated for us. He sacrificed for this new community and new humanity. He said the gates of hell won't prevail against it. He has set up an ecosystem of belonging and mattering, a culture that has a cause and a community to go with it. If he's serious about it and we're serious about following him, then how of the church is first. His church should mend social divisions, not reflect them. Second, then following Jesus isn't just about me. It's about us. And third, his church is where we wrestle with God together. As the team comes back up to lead us, I have a question and an invitation. A question and invitation. First, if Jesus' church is intended to mend social divisions and not perpetuate them, then where in your life are you aligned or misaligned with that in the recesses of your heart? Two, if following Jesus is only about me, but really it's about us, where have you and I made church about us and not about the other? Do those verses from Romans 15 ping your heart differently today? And third, Jesus' church, this church, is about where we wrestle with God together. Who is it that needs the invite to the Alpha space. I was just at King Supers before the service and they said, you look familiar. And I invited both of the baristas to Alpha and they were interested. 
cueing the research one last time, your invitation could not only impact someone's eternal life, but their very life here and now in all its flourishing. People come to church for all sorts of reasons, but they stay for just one, friendship. John Wimber, the founder of the Vineyard Church, said that. Those are the questions, the invitation. Come to the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one who recreates us into the type of people he destined us to be, the one who reconstructs our hearts so that we might participate in that new humanity he calls in Ephesians 2, that Jesus, in him, he broke down the hostility wall. He has broken enmity in us for others and him because he gave his life for our life so our life could be a gift to others. The one who reorders our internal world so we can live out Philippians 2 verse 4. Don't look only out to your own interests, but look out to the interests of others. And the one who recreates us to be the inquisitive people who hold space for the most obstinate and most resistant to faith. How is the church? The one directed and animated by Jesus will always be innovative, holding to historic theology and being so in tune with his presence and his power that we'll do everything short of sin to see people say yes to Jesus as their greatest hope and reality. How is the church? It's the one that mends social division and doesn't perpetuate it. It's the one that thinks about we and not me. It's the one where people can wrestle with faith and God together. Let's sing to the one who wrestled with it all but didn't sin. Let's sing to the one whose grace and renovation reaches as far back as your first wound and as far into the future as we trust him to take us. Let's sing to the one who chose us to take his mission forward. Let's sing to him.